Okay. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is uh, go ahead and start because um, there's a, a little bit of business I need to take care of. Um, welcome all of you. I'm Deborah Klotchko, um, Executive Director and Chief Curator of the Museum of Photographic Arts. And our guest at uh, Winescapes with Artists today is David Mizell. And um, so first of all, I like to say at any point during this, you can raise your glass and, and take a sip, but um, cheers to everyone. Cheers. We uh, definitely want to hear from you. So if you want to um, uh, write in at the bottom of your Zoom is a chat um, icon and you can type in a question if you want to hear while we're talking. Otherwise, at the end, we certainly will uh, take questions. And I am trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, we will mute you and probably turn off the videos during the conversation just so that we have, as much as I like to see everybody, um, we find that it um, helps the bandwidth of the, the Zoom. So I think we will get ready with that. And when you um, Arturo will be assisting us and we will be asking him to change the slides on the screen. So oh, wow. if, if you hear me asking uh, Arturo to do something, it's not my nickname for David, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is uh, definitely um, someone behind the scenes who makes sure that this all runs efficiently. So um, with that, I would like to uh, start today and uh, I want to, first of all, um, it was great reconnecting with you, David, because it, the last time, between the last time I'd been to your studio for a visit and our talk today, you received a Guggenheim mm. in 2018. Uh, so congratulations on that. That's uh, very important, very prestigious, and congratulations to your Guggenheim Fellowship. And it's always nice to be supported at being an artist. It's a, it's a nice validation of what you do. So congratulations. I appreciate that. Um, and you have um, an impressive background. Uh, you studied at Princeton and you went on to study, uh, get an MFA at the California School of, I'm going to say School of Fine Arts, California um, College, College of Arts. Of Art. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, CCA, mm -hmm. and it used to be CCC, right? CCAC. CCAC, okay. They dropped the final C, which yes. was craft. Uh, <laughs> I would question the wisdom of that, but it's done. Uh, they're just trying to be, <laughs> uh, I think, trendy and um, mm -hmm. helpful there. Um, so today we have um, a selection of your work. Oh, I also want to mention a lot of people like to know um, where they can find out more about your work, um, and if they're interested in acquiring your work, who your galleries are. Um, first of all, I will say that uh, your website is one of the better ones that I've run across. Um, I found it helpful, informative, easy to navigate, and um, so congratulations on that. I, I really do recommend uh, that people go visit the website because it will list uh, a number of the gal all the galleries that represent him, but also go into much more depth about his various series of work. But in New York, it's um, Hoke Gallery, and in San Francisco, it's Haynes Gallery. So um, with that, everybody stay online. You can buy after the show is over. I'm sure that'll be fine. So I don't want you rushing away. Um, Arturo, why don't we start the slides? And we're starting with the... Um, Mount St. Helens series. So um, there you go, 1983. Right. And um, David, I'm going to let you talk about this series be, um, because um, this was really the start of uh, working in an aerial, from aerial views. Mm -hmm. And it's also a very powerful, Mount St. Helens was a horrific um natural disaster but with people that were certainly impacted by it so um the power of nature is a strong one but also can be destructive 
certainly. Um, first of all, Deborah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so delighted to be doing this, and thanks to everybody else who's who's um, zooming along with us here. So um, yeah, so uh, 1983, um, dialing it back. Uh, I was a 22 year old undergrad student. Um, I had been focusing largely on studying architecture and landscape architecture. I was interested in um, where the human made environment met the natural world actually. And I had taken a few classes with Emmett Gowan, um, took a year off from Princeton, worked in an architecture firm in New York City and came back to Princeton really to work closely with Emmett. Um, uh, I felt like photography enabled me to move more quickly to make things. And that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a maker. Um, I think there are a lot of things in common for me in my interest in architecture and photography, but I was able to, to sort of move forward more quickly um, and be a creator uh, in, in terms of making photographs. Uh, there also was an amazing art history program at Princeton, and that's the way you got to study visual arts there. So I got to work closely with Peter Bunnell, um, uh, Sam Hunter, Thomas Crow, Eileen Guggenheim, just incredible art historians. But um, in the visual arts program, Emmett was, um, he, he was such an effective and generous teacher. And he was engaged with this ongoing project at St. Helens and had taken, I, I believe, one student on another trip there. And uh, I was fortunate to be able to go with him during the summer of 1983. So it'll be 37 years next month, which is kind of staggering. Um, but what really astonished and troubled me at St. Helens was, um, I mean, here we're looking at the aftermath of the volcano uh, Spirit Lake. Uh, in the upper part of the frame are, the lake is filled with these downed trees from the force of the blast, which was something like 27,000 times um, the force of the atomic bomb that had been dropped on Hiroshima. So it was just an incredible cataclysm. But if we go to the next slide, um, uh, it, it was the clear cutting of the forestry industry there um, that was changing the landscape on an equally massive and, and, and potent scale. And um, that experience um, was so huh, moving for me and profound um, and uh, affecting and troubling. Um, and it kind of started my continuing um, interests in being able to look at the earth and look at these, what I call synthetic landscapes, landscapes that have been changed by, by human uh, intervention. So yeah, St. Helens was the first experience of working from the air to make photographs. Most of the work that I made at St. Helens was from the ground with a four by five view camera or a handheld medium format camera if we were hiking up into the crater actually. Um, but the aerial view, something just clicked, you know? And um, I found it, technically very challenging, but there's this way that as you're moving through space, you, know, you can't make the same picture twice, right? Whereas from the ground with a view camera, it's very slow, meditative, on a tripod, underneath the dark cloth, focusing on the ground glass. Here it's this kind of constant stream of possible images and possible compositions, um, and it's, it's a chaotic experience in a way, um, but I like the, the sort of the struggle to make order out of that chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I felt that, that, you know, at St. Helens really, it was just getting a taste of what that aerial view could be like, um, but I knew I wanted to do more with it. And it also to some degree felt very familiar because of having studied architecture, I was used to the idea of looking at things in plan. Um, and so, you know, plan or, or even cross section or elevation, but these kind of systematic ways of analyzing space, one of them being from above. So it was a kind of challenge, you know, that I set myself uh, moving forward, you know, after St. Helens.
So I have a question for you. Uh, you said that Emmett invited uh, students to go in the summer. Were you there to create your own work? Was that the intent as opposed to assisting him? Exactly. Okay. Yes. And that's, you know, I cannot um, emphasize enough how generous he was as a teacher in general, but also when I think back on it, um, how generous it was for him to invite another person, a student along um, in uh, this kind of expedition that wasn't without danger, you know, um, whether it was because we were shooting from the air or whether it was because we were hiking up into the red zone of a volcano, which was dangerous, maybe not so much because of another eruption, although that might've been possible. Um, you know, there was a point where we were hiking, this was June, and it started to snow. <laughs> and uh, on the, as we're climbing uh, into the, the, up the flanks of the volcano, and it was very difficult to know which way was down because you're surrounded by all these canyons of ash. Um, and how do you actually, if, you, if you've lost your bearings, how do you know where to go? Well, we, what we did was we followed any downhill um, movement of water. <laughs> so we, it, was, it all turned out fine. But anyway, uh, yes, it was an incredible experience for me. And, and I was there really to make my own work. You know, the aerial expedition part of it, um, the flights were, of course, mostly for Emmett. However, he actually lent me the medium format camera uh, that I made the pictures, uh, at San, you know, the aerial uh, images that I made. Um, I had my own view camera, but yeah, he lent me this beautiful little Plowbell six by seven camera. Uh, that, and so that's what we're seeing here. So we should move on. Um, and talk about the, the publication, because publication happens with, I think, all of these series that we're going to be talking about. Right. Um, so uh, next slide. Yeah, here we are. Um, oh, OK, good. So um, in 2018, I was given the opportunity to make this little book. It's, it is diminutive. It's um, four by six inch page size. And it's part of a series published by Ivory Press uh, called their Libra Ars series. And so uh, Thomas Struth has done one, Dick Muniz has done one, Francis Elise, uh, Jenny Holzer, I think Sharon Ashad just one. You can see what they all have in common is this four by six page size. After that, the artists are given pretty much free reign, but the, 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 the books are vertically oriented. So the challenge, challenges for me were, and for, uh, for Ivory Press as well, um, for their designers, was how do you take these incredible vast landscapes and these images with so much detail and compress them down to this diminutive page and make reproductions that actually work um, so happily and also to how do you orient a vertical book where the lion's share of the, the images were, were, were horizontal so they designed this beautiful method of opening the book and this binding that lays flat and um, the tritone reproductions are just you know, exquisite. Um, and, and again, they gave me free reign, which is, you know, really generous as a, as a publisher to, for them to do that. Um, and so the book opens with um, what's really my favorite image from St. Helens is this, um, this image of the, the crater, seeing the outer edge of the crater, and then you're looking across the dome to all this material that's been blown out. And there's this kind of beautiful etching. But then it goes to this um, prose poem by Gary Snyder uh, called Atomic Dawn and he talks about um, hiking in 1945 hiking on camping on on Mount St. Helens and then hiking down back to civilization and learning that the atomic bombs had been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki while he was on the mountain um, and then it closes with a, an essay by the um, geologist Marsha Bjornerud, this beautiful essay that talks about Mount St. Helens as a metaphor um, and how the pictures kind of show this, the secret workings of the planet and this um, sort of rare intersection between geologic time and, 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 and human time. So the book was done many years after the original project. So that allowed you to kind of revisit it and um, 
put it together in a way, adding the, the poem, um, but did it feel like it was still the same project? You know, I had put that work aside um, after college. I felt like it was student work, it was Emmett's project really. I didn't exhibit it uh, after finishing Princeton um, and I wasn't really inclined to do anything with it. Mm -hmm. um, going, when the, when the opportunity to do this book came along, I could have made a book about anything. Uh, the only caveat was that it should be book, work that had been previously unpublished. Um, and there were a number of ideas that I had, but I started looking back through these old contact sheets and I thought, oh my God, the photographs are, they have everything in them that I've been working on ever since. Mm -hmm. um, and I reached out to Emmett and of course he was very lovely about it and very happy for me to be working with this material. And, um, uh, and so there's an arc, you know, there were a lot of things that I wouldn't permit myself to do when I was a younger person, let's, let's put it that way. And it made sense at the time. Um, so to come back to something, you know, decades and decades later and to find out how rich um, the experience was and how, how much um, it had really affected me and directed me, that to me is what, you know, what makes this book so, so beautiful. Um, that opportunity to, to sort of look back and to integrate who that younger person was mm -hmm. uh, with you know, where I am now. Next slide. So black maps, next slide. Yeah, so what we're looking at here is, um, it's a project by the artist Robert Smithson. And um, uh, Smithson was for me just, and still continues to be a really important uh, source of inspiration. Uh, it's a collage that he made of the Bingham Canyon uh, copper mine in Utah. And you can see in the, in the lowest part of the image, there's um, this uh, observation platform that he's designed. Um, so this was never constructed, um, it was a proposal, but he did actually make similarly themed uh, 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 sort of viewing platforms and mines in, in Holland. Um, so yeah, we can move on to the okay. next. So that became a, a in inspiration for Black Maps? Well, I was interested, yeah, I was interested in, in um, this idea of mining as a site where um, we're taking the earth apart, right? Um, on a scale that's just otherworldly. Um, and so this is an image. So yeah, and actually I wanna mention in 1985, I received a $5,000 grant from the NEA. It was when they were giving out individual artist grants. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, kudos to them <laughs> because it let me go do this work. Um, uh, my first area project on my own, really, uh, looking at mining sites throughout the American West. And so looking at the West as this kind of, and these landscapes as this kind of site of human induced trauma um, and, and very consciously going Oops, like, sorry, go back. Um, yeah, uh, going to sort of thinking about like the trajectory of 19th century exploratory photography in the West and, and that this is a kind of, it's, it's a kind of end game, you know, it's, it's like where it led to. So what this is, um, what we're looking at is an abandoned tailings pond uh, that's chock full of cyanide um, that's used in the um, mining process, the refining process. You wouldn't know that necessarily you know from looking at it and there's something about the way it sort of looks like an embryo or a clot or there's just a sense of abstraction it's very difficult to know and that was the that was the, the for me i wanted to make pictures that extended our 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 ideas of what landscape was you know so um this kind of human changed earth um you know, really for me was, was the arena that I wanted to work in. Which is something, let's go to the next slide. Um, so the lake project. Um, so it, it's something that, um, a theme that resonates throughout all of your work, which is, I mean, Mount St. Helens was nature being destructive, but what really, what you, what we were looking at was also the clear cutting. 
so the, the impact that mankind has on the environment is, is actually far worse than nature um, again and again uh, through the works that you show us. But tell us a little bit about the Lake Project. Yeah. Um, so this uh, is a, an image, an aerial image of Owens Lake, which uh, was a, um, a water-filled lake on the eastern side, side of the Sierras in California for something like 78 million years until uh, the early 19-teens when um, Mulholland built uh, or the Los, well, the California aqueduct was built due to the efforts of Mulholland. And the water from Owens Lake was diverted and drained to bring water to the um, then fledgling city of Los Angeles, about mm. 130 miles away. And so what we're looking at is like the remnants of Owen, Owens Lake and the kind of unintended consequences of that water being drained. So here we're looking at these kind of blood red waters um, there's very little water that remains in the lake. It's just a little bit of seasonal runoff from the Sierras. And it gets stained by these salt-loving bacteria uh, that, that make it this kind of vivid red, or in different seasons, it'll almost look purple. Really bizarre and unusual. Um, yeah. And um, Owens Lake still supplies something between like 40 to 60% of LA's uh, water. So this idea that um, this site became a kind of sacrificial landscape, that that um, it was sacrificed in order for LA to come into being and to exist. Yeah. Next. Um, and so again, um, you know, I spent several years in the early 2000s, um, 2001 to 2002, working here repeatedly, working at all different um, elevations, uh, all different seasons, all different times of day, um, and color, you know, really became the content. Like there's a shift, mm -hmm. uh, and we're kind of skipping over some other projects, but there was a shift where I realized the toxic colors of these sites was essential um, and expressive, and I needed to, um, in a way, leave behind this idea that um, that I was sort of, you know, raised with as a, as a young photographer, that serious photography was black and white. And it was, <laughs> um, but, but I needed to kind of um, let the pictures um, have this kind of hideousness to them uh, and this kind of um, um, difficulty because of the color, like the color and the toxic colors were really essential. You know, it's funny, I wouldn't use hideous uh, to describe uh, as a word to describe your work, it's actually quite beautiful, mm. and it's it's abstract. It's very painterly. Um, what is hideous is what it represents, and and what you've done is you've been you you allow us the viewer to be drawn in with the the beauty with the scale. Mm -hmm. um, and we have an installation shot or two coming up, so, so our listeners will be able to um, get a sense of scale. But as you begin to learn what the, the subject is, then it becomes um, startling and difficult. And, mm -hmm. and that's really, I think, one of the important strengths of your work, is that you can make that, that rich balance. Thank you. Uh, next yeah. slide. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, so that was, this was the first book, um, which I published uh, with an Israeli press uh, in 2003, I believe. Um, and uh, Chris Pickler, uh, uh, who is an Israeli press essentially, uh, gave me free reign to design it. So this was the, the first, and then very much the last <laughs> book that I designed myself. Uh, I was very happy with how it turned out, but I realized there are people better equipped to, to do that than me. Um, it also had, for me, this, um, an essay that was really vital, um, and it taught me things about my work, uh, written by Robert Sobiezik, who was then the curator of photography at LACMA, mm -hmm. um, uh, and now sadly deceased. But uh, it was an incredible experience to work with both Robert and, and Chris on this. Next slide. Oblivion, 2004. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Oblivion looks at Los Angeles um, from the air and it's a kind of coda to the light project. Uh, I'm not sure that I would have gone to make pictures in LA except for wanting to see the kind of um, 
the fallout in a way. Um, and one thing to note about this work is that it's all um, tonally reversed. So I, I did shoot it in black and white. I wanted that sense of abstraction uh, that comes with working in black and white. And as I started printing them, I thought, this is again, 2004, but I thought it, they didn't seem unfamiliar or defamiliarized enough for me. And I wasn't sure if it was going to be a successful project. And then one day I was um, looping one of the negatives on my light table. And the negative was much more powerful and um, kind of thornier and stranger and almost read like an x-ray of the city. And so I started printing them tonally reversed. And so that's what you're seeing here. And this is a diptych. It's actually the only diptych in the whole series. Um, it's two different frames, but uh, that I'm uniting. So I'm making actually a kind of fictional space here, um, but two different frames literally of me circling around um, the same setting. And I remember as I was, actually I still remember as I was shooting this, I was um, thinking about the um, Roche uh, aerial photographs of parking lots <laughs> and thinking about like, you know, that work was so important for me and I didn't understand it and I didn't understand it and I found it very, uh, as a student, very kind of alienating. And then, and, as I was shooting this from above, I thought, I think I'm, I think now I understand. <laughs> so. uh, next slide. Yeah, so this is the book and actually, um, pull it out just for scale. Um, and working now uh, with a designer who I've worked with a number of times since, Bob Offeldish, he's an amazing designer. And it's great to, um, I come to him with ideas but he always brings me back something that pushes uh, further. And uh, so that was great to be able to have that opportunity. So not every artist has the um, opportunity to uh, do a book with a, a project. And you have uh, so many projects that do connect with a publication. Um, how important is that to you? What, how does that translate the work um, it, different than seeing it on a, on a gallery or a museum wall? Yeah. I mean, exhibitions are, are wonderful opportunities. I feel like the book can actually take on a life um, that could go on, you know, potentially forever. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes into libraries and gets into people's hands that I could never know about. And I love that idea. Um, it's also a kind of platform for developing one's ideas and where an exhibition might have some text, um, books can have a lot more. Uh, and so every book I've done has had at least one essay, um, if not more. Uh, the Oblivion book had an essay by Bill Fox. This book with Scheidel, um, which was like seven different projects, the Black Maps, American Landscape and the Apocalyptic Sublime. That has seven different chapters, seven different essays. And, and it's fantastic because it, it becomes a kind of prismatic view into the work and about the work and everybody can kind of take off in the, on, into their own like trajectories and it makes the projects to me just richer and denser and also collaborative um mm -hmm. in a way that you know uh, making the pictures is not um and i love i love 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 to collaborate and and um it's a great great way to 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 be able to sort of focus attention. Next slide. Terminal Mirage. Yeah. So, okay, we're looking at, again, looking at um, Robert Smithson and, and uh, you know, his, his work so important to me and his writing. So in the early 2000s, I read that the spiral jetty that we're looking at here was reappearing from underneath the waters of the Great Salt Lake uh, where it had been. So the spiral jetty was, uh, the seminal uh, piece of land art built in 1970 or 71. It's 1500 foot long coil uh, of basalt in the Great Salt Lake. And it was built when the lake was in a drought period. Over the ensuing decades, the waters had risen and the spiral jetty was submerged beneath the waters of the lake. Now in the early 2000s, it's reemerging, And lo and behold, it's a negative version of itself. 
because instead of being black basalt, like when it was built, it's white because it's covered with salt crystals. That was phenomenal to me. That was just fantastic. Um, and it actually kind of linked up with the oblivion work, this idea of the positive and negative. Um, the spiral is both land and water, again, positive and negative above the level of the water, below the level of the water. Um, so it, it was for me like just one of these moments that, you know, the timing just things started to click. And I, um, we can, then next shift slide. to the next slide, yeah, uh, was looking at the, the periphery of the Great Salt Lake. So the Great Salt Lake is essentially being mined for, it's a, it's a what's called a terminal lake. Um, it's a geological term, meaning that it has no natural outlets. So the mineral content has been building up in the lake for eons, and now it's being mined for all these substances that are, are used for industrial purposes, including traditional photographic chemistry. <laughs> Um, so I like to think of how embedded photography is actually in making these kinds of landscapes. Um, uh, so, and here we're looking at this, um, these evaporation ponds. Uh, there's something like 40,000 acres of evaporation ponds that ring the perimeter. And it, this is like a Diebenkorn image to me, you know, I mean, I love Dieben I love mid-century painting uh, and uh, mm -hmm. there's something and I, I found out um, a few years ago uh, in reading more about Jeevan Korn that he was actually a cartographer during World War II and so he had this I, you know this 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 aerial vision um, with him and when he was making his work even the palette is yeah, yeah reminiscent yeah. next slide um, so, yeah go ahead yeah oh well this is an installation um, so can you tell us where Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art in, I believe, 2015 or 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a traveling exhibition of Black Maps, which at that point was the title of that title book. And, 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 and that title, which comes from a poem by Mark Strand, it came to encompass, you know, all of these aerial bodies of work. Um, and so we're looking here at... Um, work from Terminal Mirage, work from American Mine, uh, and then there were several other projects represented. And yeah, you were talking about scale mm -hmm. before. So all of these prints are 48 inches by 48 inches. Um, I make my own prints in-house. Um, I love printmaking. I think that comes from having just grown up, you know, working in the dark room, working with M. Gowan. Also, I studied with Ed, Ed Ranney, taught at Princeton when I was there too. So um, I love being able to have that control. Um, uh, and this was just a beautiful space. We got to paint the walls so they almost seemed like subterranean, you know, and uh, I was very, very pleased with how it came together. And the white frame is definitely um, your pre method of presentation, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the square format? What draws you to that? Yeah, um, the square format is, um, I'm working with a Hasselblad camera, uh, mm -hmm. the medium format film camera, I'm still shooting film. Uh, and it's a six by six centimeter original. But what the square does for me is, um, it does abstract the space, it compresses space, and it's not a landscape format, right? So there's a way that these, um, Joe Thompson wrote one of the essays in the Black Maps book about Terminal Mirage. And he talked about this idea of uh, making almost like a dermatological biopsy of the surface of the earth, which I love. Uh -huh. So there's a way that the, 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 the square has that aspect to it. Um, it's not a traditional landscape format, you know, so. Next slide. Library of Dust. Um, you and I have talked about Library of Dust uh, a number of times, and it is, um, I think, one, it's my favorite uh, body of, of work that you've produced. Mm -hmm. So why don't you talk about, um, about the project, how it came to be, and, and I'll talk a little bit about why it resonates so much for me. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I read about the existence of these copper canisters uh, at a point where their existence was being revealed for the first time in, in you know, ever um, publicly. 
And so the canisters are from a psychiatric hospital in Oregon, state-run psychiatric hospital. And each canister contains the cremated remains of a patient who was unclaimed by their families at their deaths. And so they, the canisters go back, I, I believe that, the, well, the, the patients, go, their deaths go back from the 1880s all the way through, I think, to the 1970s. And there was something like, originally there was something like 5,500 of them or something. Um, and so when I read about the existence of these canisters, you know, I've been photographing copper mines for so long. So I was very interested in the materiality of copper and the sort of mutability of it. Um, but when I saw the canisters, and um, there was a lot more happening with them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this was the space they were stored in. It was basically an unheated, uh, you know, not temperature controlled, not humidity controlled storage facility. Um, really brutal, actually. Stacked three deep on these pine shelves with masking tape for labels on the shelves. Um, uh, unconscionable, I, I think, um, in a lot of ways. I think the hospital didn't know what to do with them, you know. Um, and the new superintendent, uh, I think, is a real humanist. And he felt that it was important to acknowledge the existence of these canisters in order to help remove the mantle of shame around mental illness. Uh, so when I wrote to him and asked permission mm -hmm. to make these pictures, um, I was surprised that he said yes, right? Um, the, the process was fraught with other problems and, um, but ultimately I was, I was allowed to work there. Um, and, w you know, I, I, we can maybe go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Um, so I made ultimately a hundred photographs uh, or photographs of a hundred canisters. And they're quite extraordinary as objects. They're really powerful. And what's happening is that the ash is reacting in many instances with the, the copper canisters and the leaden seams and forming these minerals, these kind of encrustations actually on the exterior and the interior of the canisters um, as, as I came to see. Uh, and they're, they're really extraordinary and exquisite and powerful and sort of a way to, for, it was a way for me to think about death <laughs> and to think of, and um, my mom had passed away very suddenly. Um, and uh, I, I had also had a close friend who was felled by mental illness. And we had all as a society been through 9-11. Um, and I felt that these growths of these minerals, you know, ashes to ashes, right? But they really were doing it. They were, they were this kind of alchemical life that um, was a transformation. Right? Let's go to the next slide so we can see the variations. Yeah, and so that one in particular, you know, and it became the cover of the book, uh, which is, you know, massive tome um, that we can talk about as well. Um, the, the correspondence between the aerial work that I've been making mm -hmm. and some of these canisters was quite remarkable and strange um, and, you know, no pun intended, uncanny. <laughs> you know, the, the sort of synchronicity uh, there um, was remarkable. So I felt like I wanted to honor these people, you know, um, and and it was also the first time that I had worked in an archive um, and worked through the structure of gaining access and gaining permission and gaining finding mutual respect uh, between the um, not just the superintendent but but his his other people in the administration at the hospital that were mm -hmm. opposed to my working there and. Um, Ultimately, the um, president of the state senate in Oregon saw these images and asked to use them to argue on the senate floor for funding to rebuild the hospital. 
which had been built in the 1880s, which and it was then state of the art, but by the mid 2000s was um, in deplorable shape and was still an active hospital. Uh, in a way, almost one part jail, one part hospital at that point. And so they were able to rebuild the hospital to the tune of several billion dollars with state funding. And because of that, I think we can go to the, the next slide here. Um, oh, one more, sorry. This kind of beautiful sort of calligraphic. They're all so different and mesmerizing. We'll just next slide, Dan. Um, here, um, because of that, because in Oregon, there's a percent for art program with publicly funded um, projects, there was finally money to have a memorial structure built. And um, there was a competition. Uh, yes, Andrea Modica um, and her skulls. Uh, uh, Lyle's making a comment, it's true. Um, there was a competition held by the Oregon Council on the Arts and Lead Pencil Studios, a design firm in Seattle, was selected. And this is uh, a piece of that memorial where the canisters themselves can be exhibited. You know, I still hear from people who have, whether because of the project or because of the book, uh, or just because of the, the publicity now around these canisters, um, that have been able to identify uh, ancestors of theirs, you know, folks from their family tree that maybe they never knew about that had kind of vanished, and to reclaim them. And it's a profound experience for me as an artist to somehow even peripherally be involved in that. It's incredible. I just, a couple of weeks ago, uh, mm -hmm. heard from a woman who had um, reclaimed a great grandparent. Um, you had mentioned um, working with an archive, and, and that's one of the aspects that I really like about this work, not for the bureaucracy that you had to go through to be able to deal with an archive, but that it is an archive of death, but not in, in so negative a way. It's an archive of the remains of individual humans. And, um, and as you look at that, especially in this image, the, the sheer number of them is very, very powerful. Um, and then the fact that it, it connects so directly with, some, with your other work because of the, the um, oxidation that's happening on the surface of the can. But, but to hear you talk about it, the impact that this project had on rebuilding the hospital, connecting people with their, their ancestors, their, you know, it, it just, um, it keeps on giving, I guess, in a, in a way that is um, very impactful. And the other works, you know, you're pointing out um, the destruction, the, the clear cutting, the, and, and it's, it's important for us to be aware of that, but, but um, it's not always having that direct kind of um, impact of change. Mm -hmm. And so, I, so it's, yeah, it's I, true. I think it's powerful. That's true, but, and I would say, I couldn't go into this project thinking, <laughs> I want to make sure that they rebuild this hospital. <laughs> and like, no, no, I, no, want, I know. No, but it was like, the, the, I 100% I agree with you. And, and, and so the, the, the sort of way this project unfolded was, um, I mean, I wasn't sure if I would ever show this, these pictures ever, because I thought, you know, am I crossing a threshold of, of like, is there anything improper here? Am I, I had to make sure that I was doing this in the most respectful way possible. And I think, it's, I, I think you did the opposite. You gave honor to the deceased who were um, lost to, to time. And, um, and I can't think of anything better. Thank you. I mean, it took me a while to kind of get to that <laughs> place where I could understand that that's what I was doing myself, mm -hmm. you know, um, because, um, yeah, I use, as an artist, I just, I just kind of follow my instincts, you know, um, and this was a, a different kind of arena for me to work in. And so I had to kind of feel my way into it, you know, carefully. There was a question about, could you talk about your installation, but this wasn't your installation, was it? No, this is actually um, the canisters themselves in their new home. 
So the first slide that we saw was where they were in situ for decades and where I saw them and photographed them in that raw space. Now, flash forward maybe eight to 10 years later, and this is the memorial structure that has been built on the grounds of the hospital. It's actually rehabilitating an existing building on the hospital grounds um, that was designed by Lead Pencil Studios. It was actually quite controversial for a while because the ashes have been taken out of each canister um, and put into a separate part of the space in a kind of columbarium. So there were folks who were not so sure about that idea at first, um, but it did allow the canisters to be seen um, and, and open for folks to, 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 to you know, experience that. There were some 3,500 canisters still, and now um, the hospital has permitted you know, the ashes and the canisters to be reclaimed by descendants of, of these patients. So we should move on. Um, we, we got another question from an audience member from Julie asking why, why did they use copper? Ah, you know, um, I wasn't sure why they use copper, uh, but I have found out that other um, hospitals around the same time did the same thing. Uh, it's not an inert <laughs> substance, but it was probably at that point very inexpensive. Um, and the canisters were actually made on site by patients. Um, it's a little horrifying. Uh, yeah, this is like a cottage industry, literally, uh, uh, on, the, on the hospital campus. The campus of the hospital is extraordinary. I mean, again, it was built in the 1880s. It looks like a college campus it, uh, from that era. It has specimen trees. There's ways in which it was, I'm sure, at the time, um, you know, groundbreaking and, and, and um, very advanced. Um, but yeah, in terms of why they use copper, it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense because it obviously um, isn't a stable um, component. Um, but there you have it. Okay, next slide. History shadow. Mm. Yeah. So a new kind of archive. Right, yeah, we were chatting about that the other day. So um, having worked with the hospital, um, <laughs> I mean, again, I never would have predicted this project, but um, I was fortunate to have a residency at the Getty Research Institute, and I had gone there, the theme that year that I applied with was change, and I had gone there with the Library of Dust Project thinking um, I'll spend my time here working on assembling this into book form. By the time the residency started, I, I already had a publisher, I already had um, uh, the essayists, and it was well underway, and I thought, you know, I want to work on something at the Getty that I could only do here. And I was interested in um, the idea of cross-sections of paintings, because paintings are made of minerals, and so the mineral content, you know, going all through the mining work, the Library of Dust, and I thought potentially uh, looking at cross sections of paintings, which I found out were not very interesting, <laughs> but it did lead me to start hanging out in the painting conservation lab and making photographs there. And when I was when watching them at work, and one day when I was there, uh, there was an x ray, a multi paneled x ray taped up to the window using natural light kind of as a light box. And in front of it was the painting on the easel that it was derived from. And the discrepancy between the two, like the painting was this 19th century landscape painting, not very interesting, I didn't think. The x-ray was dramatic. It was like this Franz Klein, you know, abex, extraordinary. And it was electrifying. I thought, oh my God, like I have to start looking at x-rays. And the Getty has these archives of x-rays um, in different parts of the museum. Uh, there's the, in the painting conservation lab, then also at the villa, uh, where there are x-rays of objects from antiquity, uh, and then the decorative arts department as well. So I shifted pretty rapidly to looking at x-rays of um, artwork from antiquity, three-dimensional. And so that's what we're seeing here. And they are, um, you know, ghosty and, and yet, you know, very much kind of reanimating 
these uh, artworks. This is actually an x-ray from the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. Um, you know, the Gettys collection is remarkable and the x-rays were really interesting. Um, it's a little bit like a needle in a haystack to find ones that, that are interesting. But uh, I also wanted to work with um, non-Western art. And I also had this idea of looking, literally looking inside Buddhas, which is what we're, we're doing here. We're looking inside a Bodhisattva. Um, I wouldn't let myself um, learn anything about the object of origin while I was looking at the x-rays. I didn't want to know the scale of the original object or what it was made of. I waited until sort of the end of the project. So I didn't want that to influence how I felt about them. So were you photographing the negative? I'm the, photographing the, the, I'm, the, I'm re -photographing, the yeah, I'm re-photographing right. the original x-ray uh, and then using that negative and actually work in color uh, um, really sort of subjectively back mm -hmm. into the image. Yeah. Next slide. I mean, that, that specific object is, I think, really small. <laughs> and yeah, so, you know, I'm adding a lot of black space around it and sort of taking my liberties with it. Next slide. Ah, and then this is the the cover of the book, again, an Israeli press publication, came out in 2010. Uh, and in it, um, there's a really wonderful short story by Jonathan Lepham uh, that he wrote in response to the images called, uh, hold it up here, it's another biggie, um, called X Curator. And X is the name of a curator who has X-ray vision and can see inside of these objects in the museum that he works with. So there's a great opportunity to um okay. we have a I think we need to mute. Yeah. Okay. Um yeah. okay. okay. So the, the history of shadows is really, I think, one of your um, more poetic uh, series. There, there is something that is um, luscious about them. Um, and uh, because you're seeing through, because the edges are not hard or sharp, uh, because of the dimensionality of the, the uh, object itself, there, there's that wispiness that is really uh, quite lovely. And then let's go to the next one. Shadow painting mm -hmm. is also x-ray. Right. And so ultimately, I, I went back to the Getty once my residency had completed. Um, I was able to go back and actually start to work with the x-rays of painting. So what had sort of inspired the project to start with? Completely different, um, which surprised me just how different they are. Um, Again, you know, the x-rays of the three-dimensional objects you're seeing inside and outside, interior and exterior, front, back, and interiors all mapped onto this two-dimensional surface. Here with the painting, okay, well, paintings are sort of quasi-two-dimensional to start with, but for example, here you're seeing all the, the nails that are coming in and all the edges, and um, you know, they're quite, they're quite beautiful. I was talking to you the other day, about this book that was really important for me at the time. And it mm -hmm. um, it's called Atomic Light, um, Sha Atomic Light Shadow Optics. And it talks about the confluence of the discovery of the X-ray, which sees inside the body, and then coinciding with the invention of psychoanalysis, which sees inside the mind, and then uh, also more or less simultaneous with the invention of photography or really cinema, uh, which kind of sees inside the structure of time. And so that book somehow like explained exactly what I was after with this project it was great um, and to kind of stumble into it at the time. So yeah, I think there's one or two more. But again, I wouldn't let myself- Next slide. You know, know what I was looking at until later. Um, why, why did you do that? Was, I, I just mean, wanted to respond to the x-ray as its own thing. You know, uh, mm -hmm. the very first one that I saw, you know, the discrepancy was so wild between the object of origin 
and the x-ray the x-ray itself was, was was really sort of energized and magnificent and i just you know i didn't want to be influenced you know like this is what is this from i can't even remember i think this is a um a daumier painting and i think the first one was a botticelli um you know you don't need to know in a way mm -hmm. it's like going through the veils of time looking through the past and not being able to kind of see it 100% but you're getting something else um, that is is coming up and that you're responding to um, we should move on we have two more series to talk about yeah. uh, proving ground and something different yeah yeah um, well in a way now you know we're turning to looking at the American West as right a, um, uh, site of these kind of traumatic disturbances. Um, one of the sites I photographed in Terminal Mirage in 2003 uh, was an, an army depot where expired chemical weapons are stored. And that sent, you know, all kinds of shockwaves through me, mm -hmm. like why and where do they come from and how do they get there and what happens with them. And um, so where they come from is one valley away, uh, the site of Dugway Proving Ground we're looking at an aeronautical chart. Next slide. Here. Um, and so it took me a decade to get permission to photograph here. Um, it's, a, it's a site that cover a military installation that covers some 800,000 acres uh, in the Great Salt Lake Desert. So that makes it about the size of Rhode Island. It's massive. Um, and it's where the military, um, one of their primary missions is, is the development and testing of chemical and biological weapons and defense programs. So it's a very sort of dark place. Um, how, how did you even get permission, even after 10 years? Well, as it turns out, a friend of mine uh, does work with the Pentagon. And so he, you know, we were chatting about my interest in Dugway and, you know, I thought of it as like, well, I'd also like to go photograph on Mars, but you know, it's probably not gonna happen. <laughs> so it was a kind of fantasy. Uh, uh -huh. And he said, you know, I might be able to help you. And so in 2004, uh, he approached his contacts at the Pentagon to make the inquiry on my behalf. And the answer was not now. Well, that was very encouraging, right? You know, three years after 9-11, under a Republican administration, uh, as this country was also at war, you know, not now, it was like, well, maybe someday. Mm -hmm. So periodically we would check back in and, um, you know, the stars began to align under Obama's second administration. And uh, I was, I have to say, uh, I was treated with great respect by the folks at, at Dugway. Um, civilians are not generally allowed in there. They're certainly not allowed to photograph. I wasn't given free reign. Every site I wanted to photograph was highly vetted. Um, so this particular structure I was fascinated by. It was the one site that I photographed that wasn't pre-approved. Um, it's basically like, there's nothing inside of it. It's like a storage shed. Um, but I found its geometry really, really fantastic. Um, and it looked like some minimalist sculpture. And as it turns out, the purpose of this building is for it and really its shadow to be seen from above by Air Force pilots as they make their way to a bombing testing range beyond those hills that you can see beyond those mountains in the left side of the image. So it's part of a sequence of six. Um, and I love this, this idea that, that it was basically made to be seen from the air. Next slide. Okay, so now looking from, from above, um, I w was able to make these photographs of these test grids. Uh, they're basically biological test grids and dispersal zones. So um, substances are detonated and then their toxicity rates are measured over time and space as they, as they sort of expand across the landscape. Um, and I'm also superimposing my own grid 
this three by three grid over each of these images. So the circles that we see on the, the ground are the, the measurement that they put in place. Exactly. And you're adding the grid, um, the sort of um, map making uh, yes. kind of a mark. That's right, that's right. And so the, you know, the grids themselves are these kind of Saul the Wit minimalist <laughs> drawings, you know, uh, sort of um, inscribed on the earth. They're really quite, quite beautiful in a way. Um, so yeah, we can go to the next slide as well. Um, yeah, and then as you look closely, um, you can see these X's inscribed mm -hmm. uh, there. And then if you look even more closely, uh, say in the upper left-hand grid, you can see a circle. So this is a giant sort of tic-tac-toe board or something going on there. But yeah, I wanted to um, inscribe my own grid just to kind of underscore this way that um, this Cartesian, you know, this idea that we can actually measure all this, this stuff accurately, um, this, this sort of desire for objectivity. So I kind of wanted to question that almost by by, by doubling down on it. So that's that's the reason for the gridding. And it was added when you printed? Yes. Or when you shot it? It was added when you added printed. In the yeah, and actually if we go, I think the next slide that shows the installation, yeah. Mm -hmm. So these, this is from an installation of a solo exhibit of Proving Ground from 2019 at the Nora Eccles Harrison Museum of Art. And I'm printing these direct, I'm printing these directly on aluminum. So these are actually the, I, I said I print everything myself. These I cannot print in-house myself, but each um, square is 40 by 40 inches. So ultimately the pieces are a little more than 10 by 10 feet because I'm also having space between each of these squares. So what drew you to presenting this work in, in such a large way? You know, I really wanted the viewer to be kind of overwhelmed by them. Um, it was, and I have one here in my studio that I, that looks down on me. Um, they're almost like enormous drawings, the way they're rendered, the, 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 the metal kind of reads through subtly. Um, and so there's a kind of graphite like quality to them. Um, and I felt like, you know, when I started making my own work, uh, you know, this is a, decades ago, but you know, if you made a nice eight by 10 print or even something as enormous as 11 by 14, you know, that was enough. Um, but, you know, as time has gone on and I feel like I am engaging with contemporary art in all media, um, I really felt that the scale in this instance you know, it wasn't about the, the refinement of detail that I might achieve in a smaller version of this, um, but it was about the relationship of the human body, the viewer, to this thing that was really overwhelming them and could sort of take up their peripheral vision. I don't know that we have an installation shot that shows it, but we actually, I wanted to, I wanted to do this for a long time, uh, and here we have the opportunity, to, and we actually installed one on the floor. Um, so it became like this, this sort of sculptural aspect to it. And then mm -hmm. the viewer can actually look down on it. So I'm getting some questions for you. Um, so this work is on aluminum, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, do you do this as an addition? And your other work, what are you printing on? And um, mm -hmm. what edition yeah. do you usually um, do? These are in a, an edition of, I believe, two. Um, the other images say from Black Maps and say from that um, Smoka Museum installation, they're, depends on the body of work, generally they're an addition of five or six at that scale. And, and you then, print multiple sizes? Uh, for the color work, they're generally, the 40 by 48 is the larger size and then also 29 by 29. Uh, and generally those would also be an addition of six. The Oblivion work is one size only, and that's 40 by 40, so it's a kind of intermediate size. Um, and the reason for that specific size is it's the point where the grain 
in the film start to be read in the way that I want it to be. So it's starting to really kind of break down the image, not so enormous that it's completely kind of um, obvious, but that there's this sense of almost like the city being made out of ash. So it was, mm -hmm. it was a, you know, not a marketing issue. It was more like, like what's the exact scale that this actually happens at. And so I'm printing now um, here in my studio for all of that other work. And um, they are um, pigment prints um, using um, pigments, uh, you know, literally from the earth, right? <laughs> to mm -hmm. make these inks. Um, Oh, and the question is, what is an addition? Uh, oh, we're not, we're saying not addition, but, but addition, E-D-I-T-I-O-N. So, so the, so in, in other words, um, I'll make six prints uh, of any image and then, then that's it. That's all that's available. Plus any. And, and your gallery usually, or a gallery usually, uh, the price goes up as you move, as you sell through an addition or no, no with um, yours? only, no. Um, we should talk to them. <laughs> no, no, no. In fact, I used to do it that way uh, mm -hmm. a while ago. And then at least 10 years ago, I decided that that wasn't really how I wanted my work to be um, marketed or seen um, as this kind of artificial, um, you know, get it while it lasts kind of thing. If somebody wants an image, um, it's not who can grab it first. I mean, it is in that it's addition, but it's, I, I just felt like it, it added this kind of false, um, there was something about it didn't, didn't feel right for me. So, okay. Yeah. We should go to the next image. Next slide. Mm. Okay. So this is the Proving Ground book, which um, was published in January by Radius Books. I'm reaching for my copy of it here. Um, and it's, it's really something I'm really pleased with and, and, and proud of. Uh, Radius is an extraordinary publisher. They're a nonprofit, which means they distribute, I believe, I believe 300 copies of every title that they publish to underserved libraries around the country. That's fantastic. So this idea that, you know, somebody's gonna go into a library and stumble on this book. Um, we used metallic inks uh, in, in reproducing the, the aerial images because I wanted them to feel as close to these um, uh, prints on aluminum as possible. And actually um, the design of the book, I'm gonna, so here it's hard to see, but here you're seeing one of the gridded images and then the subsequent spreads are full, full bleeds where we take the, that gridded image and see the nine parts of it. In, oh, in we have a slide. Let's go to the next slide yeah. because. Oh, did we do that? Okay, I can't remember. Oh, so yeah. here we're on press. Um, you know, I'm peering down at this, and actually, you can see David Chicky as well. David is the publisher and designer uh, at Radius. Uh, an amazing. Uh, accomplice to work with on this project. Um, and the green images that you can see there are um, something that I was very pleased made it into the book fairly late in the game. They are um, video stills from drone footage that was made by the military of a detonation of um, 100 tons of chlorine gas at Dugway, and it's really uh -huh. horrific. And so the, the sequence is, um, there are these kind of markers through the book showing actually in reverse order, um, the, the detonation kind of <laughs> from its grandest, um, uh, where the chlorine gas is disseminated the most, and then going back to the point of detonation near the end of the book. And um, I was very, very happy to have the incredible opportunity to, to work with Radius on this has really been amazing. Um, before we go on to the next series, I, I have a question from Maggie, and she says that she remembers you having small albumin prints of yes. Proving Ground grids. Are those available in addition as well? Yeah, so the, that's, thank you, Maggie. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, I had the opportunity to collaborate with a printmaker named Barrett Oliver, uh, who's just truly remarkable. Um, artisan, craftsman, working with 19th century processes. 
And you know, I talked earlier about the influence of 19th century exploratory work. And so we made an addition of, uh, it's a portfolio and there are nine aerial images in each portfolio and they're an addition of five. Um, and we're printing them, I wanna say they're 12 by 12 inches, I believe. Um, and without the grid. So this idea of a more unified way of seeing the, the work that references um, 19th century exploratory photography. Yeah, Maggie, I'm glad you mentioned that, thank you. And they're available? Yes. Okay, through your gallery? Yes. Okay, um, so can we go on to the next and final? Yeah. Desolation Desert, your current project. Well, thank you to the Guggenheim Foundation for funding this. Um, yeah. Um, so I began working last year in the Atacama Desert in Chile, looking at mining sites, uh, in particular sites where lithium is mined and also where copper is mined. Um, the Atacama is the highest and driest desert on the planet, and it's environmentally very, very sensitive. And parts of it are, I mean, all of it is, is remote. Parts of it are remote really in the extreme. It's also at extremely high elevation. So it was actually the most difficult um, working conditions I've ever had. But uh, I was interested in lithium in particular because- Lithium uh, batteries. Yes, we're all, we're all using it all the time now in our iPhones, in our laptops, in our uh, electric vehicles. And we're seeing we're thinking that this is a solution. It's not a solution. It, it just shifts the burden onto the Southern Hemisphere uh, uh, where most of the planet's uh, lithium reserves are. And again, it comes at a, at a price. So these are essentially, you know, sacrificial landscape. So again, we're seeing um, the lithium is pumped as a sort of a brine um, from underneath the surface of the earth. And then it's in these evaporation ponds for months and months, uh, going through these different um, stages and processes. And then ultimately it makes its way uh, on train cars to the port city of Antofagasta, and where I was actually staying. And from my hotel window, I could see the tanker ships that were going to China uh, with this lithium that then would come back to us in the form of our, our iPhones and et cetera. So. Next slide. Um, and again, this is a tailings pond, so going uh, from a copper mine. So going, you know, back to that very first black and white image we saw, I wanted to bracket that with, with this one, which is um, almost feels like we're inside, again, inside the human body somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but tailings ponds are the wastewater um, uh, sort of dumping grounds for all the water that's used in the mining process. And typically they're really highly toxic um, with, you know, filled with heavy metals. So there's this kind of specter of environmental um, destruction there. And how far is it from the cities and human habitation? And, you know, you, you talked about it being a, a very fragile ecosystem. Mm. Um, what does its destruction really mean? Well, its destruction means that there's really no water left for the indigenous villages that have been there for centuries. Um, they're selling their water rights without having any way to replace that water. Um, it means that all of the plant life um, that does grow in the Atacama um, is subject to um, um, being eradicated. Um, and uh, it, it just also the toxic heavy metals that are sort of um, byproducts of mining um, do get into the groundwater and you know move on from there. Um, the Atacama Desert, you know, is not a highly populated area, but there are there are actually villages and small cities throughout it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's always a price that we're paying, essentially. Mm -hmm. you know? um, uh, this is, I believe, the last image, and it's one of a group of six from uh, Desolation Desert, and it depicts a series of massive interlinked tailings pond from a mining complex. And um, they 
reminded me, even when I was above them, um, looking at them and, and photographing them, of this series of epic abstract expressionist paintings uh, by Robert Motherwell, uh, Elegy to a Spanish Republic. And that's an interesting you know, thing because I do feel like a lot of these pictures for me have a kind of elegiacal aspect to them. So, you know, his were intended as a kind of lamentation or like a funeral song. So, um, kind of makes sense that we end with that. Okay. <laughs> so, do we have questions from every, from folks? I have a question. Yes. Oh, um, how, how are you taking these um, pho photographs from the plane. I I'm wondering what kind of planes they are, and are you holding the camera? Or are they attached to the plane? How does right. how does it work? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm hand holding a Hasselblad camera, medium format camera, and I use a gyroscope, which um, is a device that helps absorb some of the vibration of the plane. I would say 90, 80 to ninety percent of the time, I'm working from a plane. Um, usually a Cessna. Um, in some instances, I'm working from a helicopter by necessity, uh, like the Oblivion work over Los Angeles. Um, there's so much air traffic there that that was really the only way we could get permission um, to, to work there was, you know, the air traffic controllers would be like, okay, there's a 747 coming in at 9,000 feet. So you got to park yourself, you know, over here at 12,000 feet or whatever it might be. Um, but, uh, in the Atacama, because the elevation was so high and the distances were so great, I actually had to work with a larger plane than normal. Um, it was actually a plane, I think it was a Piper, that was intended to be used for medical evacuations. Um, so uh, it also had a port in the floor. So I, I, I wanted to try this. Um, and it, it wasn't successful at all, <laughs> but I wanted to see what it would be like to actually look directly down, to be you know, right on top of this thing. Instead of have banking the plane, and that one that we talked about, Diebenkorn maybe describes it really well. When you're banking the plane, space is getting kind of twisted and torqued as I'm look, angling back and trying not to get the strut of the wing and the image back and down. So it's, a, it's actually, the forms don't necessarily really exist that way ever, except for that brief moment. Looking through a port hole, you're looking more or less straight down. And it is a more purely cartographic view. What I found was I didn't like working that way at all because I couldn't see what was coming um, in advance. But I also didn't like the fact that it was intended to be more objective. I actually want it to be subjective. I want it to be a space that only exists because of how the plane is in this weird angle uh, and, 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 and the moment that I'm seeing it, so. Oh, thank you. Other questions? Um, while people are thinking of their questions, um, we had talked about what you're working on now and you said you are going back to, well, that you're painting. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, we're living th in through some pretty mm -hmm. unique moments in time right now. And, um, you know, I used to paint and draw, especially draw a lot, especially when I was studying architecture. And I have art supplies at my studio that I haven't worked with in a while. And my studio is very close to my home. Um, I can be here and be safe. Um, and I've just found it very cathartic to um, make things right now uh, and um, not to be working in photography, but to be working in abstraction, uh, which is something that I'm always doing as I'm making photographs. But yeah, I'm having a good time with it. I won't ask you to bring one out yet to, to make a another, comparison. Another time, another time. Yeah. Um, so uh, this actually has gone on um, longer than, than normal, but um, it's been uh, wonderful talking with you and sharing um, the progression of your work and seeing all of the connections. Um, so what I'm gonna do is say thank you, um, yeah. let you know a 
everyone know about our guest uh, next Friday for Winescapes with Artists is Kevin Cooley, uh, who is uh, uh, also an amazing photographer. And so I want to thank everybody. And if anyone has a last question, uh, you can try and get that in now. But um, one new message. Let's see. I guess we're just getting thank you. So. Um, well, thank you, Deborah. Yes. It's been really a pleasure, and thanks to everybody for joining. And can we get everybody's video back on, Arturo, before we leave? So we can just, again, raise our glass, thank everyone for joining us, and thank, um, thank you, David. It was really a pleasure to be able to talk to you and um, share with everybody else. So thank, thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Deborah. It's really a pleasure for me, too. And enjoy the rest of the wine. Now you can drink. Yes, I'm now. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for, um, you're in your studio now, and thank you for having the artwork um, that we can engage with. So You're very welcome. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. We'll see everybody next week. Great. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you. Okay.